This is daily coding problem numero two. It is given an array of integers. Return a new array such that each element at index i of the new array is the product of all numbers in the original array except the one at index i. For example, if our input was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the expected output would be 120, 60, 40, 30, 24. If our input was 3, 2, 1, the expected output would be 2, 3, 6. I think it would have made a little more sense if they would have included the uh, 3, 2, 1 example first, but no big deal. Right here you can see uh, 3 times 2 and not including 1 would be 6. And uh, 2 times 1, not including the 3, would be 2. And 3 times 1, not including the 3, would be 3. So that's what's going on, just in case you didn't want to do these this big math stuff in your head right here. So that's basically a factorial problem, I suppose, right there. Oh no, I didn't even think about a factorial solution. Well, I guess that would only apply if that was the, uh, the exact input, so cool. And I did go over this a couple times ahead of time so that I wouldn't have a lot of ums and ohs and scratching my head as much. So what I'll start with is uh, make sure so we're, we understand it, I think. That we're just multiplying every single number in the list together except for each one at each index and we somehow need to effectively iterate through all that and fill a new list, a return list. And that's it. This one is rated with a difficulty of hard. I don't think it's overly hard, but if you try and do all the possible ways, like iterative, recursive, functional, and take all that into consideration, then it can become very pretty difficult, especially if you suck at programming like I do. Okay, so first of all, grab that test fodder. Bring it over here, go down a bit, paste it in. And we will turn these into So that one would produce that. This one would produce this, of course. Line it up nice and neat here. Get rid of that. OK, so the first one we'll do will be the iterative solution. And I'm not going to name these with good function names, because I always never satisfied with the name I come up with, so I'll just use a name that describes the overall technique that I'm using to accomplish it. So that would be iterative, of course, in this case, and I will name that function accordingly right here, iterative, and it will take a list of numbers, and then we're going to say, this is sort of my process, how I build it up, so you might notice along the way, like, oh, you should have, like, initialized some variable, or you should have done this or that. Um, but just give it a minute and see that I'll kind of like, instead of trying to pre-plan data structures, even if it's just a one-off variable or whatever, I'll just try and go through and think more about the overall recipe and then go back and sort of initialize the variables as necessary in that order. So for, I'm gonna use an index value in this because normally, especially in Python and high level, dynamic -y kind of languages I'll try and avoid. It's best to avoid using the good old-fashioned index, but this is one of those rare situations where I think the index is best because then I can uh, efficiently take the list and splice out, like split it at that index effectively, and combine the two pieces that don't have that index element in it. And that way we can effectively go through and do what we're trying to accomplish here. So for i in the range of the length of numbers, and this is basically just doing like a for i loop, just like you would in other languages, just in case you're not quite familiar with the Python way. And in Python, when you see this range, range of the length of something, that's sort of a code smell, like an idiomatic code smell to say, hey, try and think if you could do it some other way. Um, 
enumerate would be cleaner and more Python specific a little bit, tad bit, but I'm going to go ahead and do it this way because I think it's a little more general and kind of like reads well and explains itself to people who might be trying to fudge over from another language and figure out what's going on. Okay, so for each index throughout the length of numbers, which would effectively be 0 through but not including, like if there were 10 numbers given, it would be 0 through 9. Okay, which would be 10 values, of course, but index is 0 through 9. And then for each number in numbers, and what we're going to do here is a Python sort of list magic, very Python idiomatic. So you can do this in other languages, but whenever you see these like little one off cool little Python things, um, that probably take a little block of code in other languages like Java and whatnot instead of being so succinct like they are in Python. But if you just think about what's getting accomplished and then think about that little block of code that you could accomplish the same thing in Java or something and just supplement that, substitute that as necessary. Okay, so we would say from 0 to the... So from the 0 index to the index right here, this index i, right? but not including. So that's from zero up to, but not including I. So effectively the first time through would be zero through zero, which would uh, basically, I think that would give you nothing. That should give you nothing. And then what we're gonna do is add that to, I've never tested that specifically, so we could try and run it and that should give us an error. And then we can tab over to that shell and type, uh, We'll make a list. A list is a keyword, so I'll just call it A equals one, two, three, four, five. And then we can say A zero through zero. And that gives us an empty list, which is what I was thinking. And then if we do A um, zero through just like that, zero and on, that will give us the whole list. And as a matter of fact, in Python, you can even shorten it down one and just go like that. And so if you omit that number at the beginning, it means start at the beginning. And if you omit it at the end, it means all the way to the end. So that's saying, give us a copy of this list from the beginning to the end. And now we're going to go over here. And then, of course, the next time through, this will be zero up to not including one. So it will only give you that first element. But then what we want to do is we want to say numbers again. And we want to say, to effectively skip, we'll say i plus, you know, go one beyond i, i plus one through the end of the list, which is kind of like saying length of numbers, right? But we don't need to do that. We can just say like that and leave it empty. Okay, so yeah, this first one will be effectively like, you could think of it almost like negative one or something or nothing. And then this one will be, since I will be zero the first time through, this will start at one and give us the rest of the list. So if there was 10 elements, zero through nine, it will give us one through nine. And that way we're not including, as you can probably tell, that index value that we're not supposed to include. And we do that for each index value and we come down here and splice together a new little list like that. And that's how I think you might be able to see how that's working. Okay, and then what we want to do is have a product. We want to track a product that's equal to the product times that number because we want to sort of accumulate that thing. So obviously we need a product and we want that product to be different for each i because the index is going to change so the product will change. We'll put that right there. Product equals and we'll initialize it to 1 there's addition, of course, we initialize it to zero, but we're initializing it to one because multiplication, if you multiply stuff by zero, you're always gonna have a zero, right? So one times one is one. I think you can figure out the rest there. And then um, Python and a lot of other programming languages, instead of doing product equals product times product like that, we can just do, uh, oops, just like that. Okay, so good, good time to pause and reflect right here. So we have our thing, it takes our list. We come in for the length, a range of the length of that list. So this length will give us, you know, if there's 10 numbers, it will give us a 10. 
and then by saying range 10 there effectively because of course that will get evaluated first then that will give us a range from 0 up to but not including 10 so 0 through 9 and for that first one it will come through it will initialize product at 1 and then for each number in that list without the index in it it's going to multiply all those numbers together and accumulate that that uh, result and I can't even remember what the what's called is it called a it's not a factor product oh yeah product duh <laughs> I guess that's what it is you accumulate that product okay and then after we're all done with that we want to have a products list products plural that will store at that index value it's going to store the product that resulting product accumulated product okay so of course and then that will be regardless of where we're at that will be a little bit more global within our local scope if I can get away with saying that probably shouldn't don't be too confusing so products equals an empty list so now in Python what you can do there's a few ways you can initialize this list so you can have an empty list like this and you can say um, you can use a list comprehension and say for uh, each in the length of numbers actually be there I put two there because it's supposed to be in the range of length of numbers so for each in the range of the length of numbers which is that same thing as right below there we can uh, do none like that and what I'll do is real quick I'll copy that over to the console here and we'll replace numbers with some little list literal like that and then you can see that's what it returns effectively so it's five nuns because right there we passed it five values right so it's kind of like a flattened little for each statement it's a little idiomatic pythonic way of saying it so you just basically skip this first part to begin with that's the final result so you just say it reads like this for each in range da 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 and then there would be a colon here and then below that it would be like add none to the list you know that's kind of what's going on there so um, that's a little long and wordy so Python has an even shorter way of doing it and that is like this And we can just say for the length of like that. And then that will effectively return the same thing as well. So we could do the, all, like, obviously I should use that other one because it's a little shorter and sweeter. And I just wanted to illustrate all this. Of course, I am uh, getting the length of numbers twice, so it's arguable whether or not we'd want to just. You know, it's starting to violate the don't repeat yourself rule, but it's sticking a little bit leaning towards KISS, I'd say. Keep it stupid simple. Um, but if we really wanted to, we could, you know, get like num length equals length of, uh, don't like IDEs when they do that, numbers. Like we could do that, right? And save a calculation, but not a huge deal. And to tell you the truth, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get rid of even all of this. And I was just doing that to kind of illustrate some Python ways of doing things. And also in other languages, you're going to have to like initialize in some way, shape or form. You're going to have to initialize like an array or a list or something like that. And in Python, if you do that, you can't come down and index an empty list because, you know, if I have a if I have like an empty list like that and I try and index it at zero, then it, it gets mad. But you can see I can have an empty list. But if I have a, a list with a item in it and I index that list at zero, then it gives me that item. So it's okay as long as there's something at that index. So what I can do instead is just get a little bit more object oriented and use the append method because it will just happen to work out in this scenario. And I think that keeps it the simplest right there. So that's going to create an empty list, which basically an array or an array list, and maybe in whatever language you might use, be using, it's going to go through, 
the range of the length of the numbers, and initialize the product to 1 for each number in that list without the index, effectively, because we're going up to the index but not including, and then we're appending onto that little portion of the list, uh, one past the index and on. Oh yeah, we can get rid of that zero too. It's sort of implied we don't need it. And then we're going to start with the product, which will be one times uh, whatever, like 120. And then that will, the product will become 120. It will go through the next one. And well, actually it will skip one the first time, right? So it will be, and it won't be 120. It will be two. And then it will come through the next time and it will be two times three, which will be six, and that will store in the product. And then it will come back to right here, and then it will be six times four, 24, uh, six times, or 24 times five, which should be 120. Yeah, okay. And uh, then after it does all that, it will, fall through because it's done iterating through all the numbers in this sub list right here and it will append that product into the products list so that will effectively set the one at range zero which will just so happen to sync up with where i's at then after it does that it will come back out here to this for loop this outer for loop and it will increment i by one so i will become one reset the product to one come in here um, give you element zero then skip past element one and then give you the rest of the list and uh, that will effectively give you one times one will be the product go through it's skipping two effectively so then it will be times three uh, which will give you three and it will store that then it will be times four which will be 12 times 5 60 so looks like we're on the right track and all we need to do now is Break after we roll through all those for loops and build up that list, we'll return it. Return products. And let's see how that runs. No errors. Type error. Function object not subscriptable on line 16. Oh. <laughs> Iterative. We need to call it like that. And then I'm going to go ahead and wrap them in print statements while we're at it. Maybe I'll space it a little bit so that it just looks maybe a little bit cleaner. Okay. F5 to run it in idle. And there we go. That looks like 236, 236, 120, 60, 40, 30. 24, 120, 60, 40, 30, 24. So that's pretty good for the iterative. Um, we could arguably do better than that, but for now that's where we're gonna leave it at. We're gonna move on to the functional way of solving this problem. And if you notice on the original problem over here, it said uh, follow up, what can you do it without using, <laughs> what if you can't use division? And this was the first way, coincidentally, I just solved it off the top of my head pretty much. So I thought that was funny because it doesn't even use division. But then once you get to the little bit more, or I should just say all the other approaches pretty much favor division. So, but anyway, we knocked that one out for what it's worth to me. I don't want to get into the low level division alternatives. I don't think there's, you know, this is the non-division way right here. Okay. So did I copy these? Then I'll come up here a few and paste them. And then we'll do def uh, functional. And that will also take numbers. And we'll come down here and change this to functional. Oop. And so with functional, it's going to be more of map and reduce style thing, which most 
times, I'd say probably the vast majority of times, you want to avoid in Python specifically. I'm just doing this to be sort of more illustrative, like as if you were in a functional language that would most likely provide like map and reduce functions. Um, if you are tempted to do a functional answer in Python, then you should consider comprehensions instead because comprehensions are sort of the best of both worlds. They give you that short, sweet, flattened um, iteration and they are very fast. They don't involve, uh, you don't have to worry about blowing the stack. It's still technically iterative under the hood and that was sort of like when I showed how to do products, how to initialize it with um, the whole, f the for statement wrapped in there. Where is that? So right here, that's a comprehension. That's a list comprehension is what that's called. So you can see that's a one liner instead of a multi-liner and it, you know, so it's short and sweet. Once you get used to reading them, they're very readable usually. If they're not, then maybe you shouldn't be using that way. Um, and they don't have any of the speed trade-offs. And so that's the thing. In a real functional language, you it, you wouldn't have that choice, you know, because you're, you know, in a purely functional language, you're not typically going to have anything resembling a for loop or any of that. And the map and reduce and all that will be more more optimal in that situation. So anyway, I'll shut up and get to it. So the map, of course, just in case you're not too familiar with like map, filter, and reduce, I'm not an expert on it by any means, but mapping is where you map a little function to each, basically each thing in a list, you know, in Python, each thing in any kind of an iterable sequence, I think basically would be the right way to say it. So of course this comes from like Lisp to my knowledge, which is Lisp processing. So with map, what we do is the first thing we do is we pass it like a function and then we pass it some iterables, any amount of iterables after that. And it will take those iterables and pass, you know, one at a time each, the first index values it will pass them into the function. So for the function would need to take like X and then whatever, um, you know, maybe Y, Z or whatever you want to name those the first item, each item in succession off of those type of lists like that. And if you're wondering if uh, Python can do inline functions, it can, is lambda functions. You just use the lambda keyword and it, can, it literally, in Python, I'm glad to say personally that they do restrict it to one expression on one line for a lambda. Anything else you need to go define a little function, which I think that's the cleanest way to do it, honestly. It's like, if you can't get away with it like this, then don't, you shouldn't be doing it like this most times. So anyway, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass the map, the numbers, I'll go ahead and just leave that. That's not a complete Lambda expression yet, but, or Lambda statement, I guess I should say. I don't know, you call it. Anyway, uh, we'll pass it the list of numbers, right? As the second deal. And then once we get that number, each number out of that is going to get passed in as n. And we're going to say, with n, we're going to call a reduce. So what reduce does in the map reduce paradigm thing is it takes a bunch of things in a list and it like adds them all together. It does some operation that reduces a list of values down to one value. So in this case, obviously, we need to multiply everything in that list. So reduce is also going to have an inline function. And it's going to take, well, I'll call it a comma b. It's going to take those two, an a and a b, and it's going to multiply them together. Excuse me, and it's going to do that with numbers also. Because what we're doing here is you can see how it nested in there. A little bit tricky. Um, so we got to kind of do two little operations here, right? We need to uh, get the the product and then we need to have like sort of a outer list too. So this is like the reduction here or not that appending part, everything. This is like the reduction right there. And even technically that product would be part of that. So that's the reduction right there. 
and then this um, outer part of the pending is more of like the mapping based on the result of this reduction if I have it right the day it's turning into a long day for me so that might not be a good explanation I'm starting to short out okay um, passing that in the list of numbers I'm passing in the list of numbers as n actually so I don't need to spell it like that and so this is that lambda expression effectively and all it does is it's taking these in as the parameters just like up here where they go and then there's an implied return statement because it, it has one expression that evaluates and it returns the value of that expression so this will effectively evaluate to a function definition right here first and then when it calls it after, as reduce calls it on that list and what reduce will do is it will take the first two values of that list and it will multiply them together then it will call itself again it will call the lambda again anyway with the result first of that first pass through the a times b and then it will get the third item index value 2 out of that list and it will multiply it against that previous result so it's doing that like an accumulation effect so that's what's going on there and uh, then when all that's said and done do I have enough parentheses oh I better get this video done because I'm my brain power is really draining quick so that's going to do all that and that's going to leave us in Python with a math object instead of going which is an iterable per se gives you the iterable interface it's not rolled out it's more CPU intensive than it is uh, memory intensive so it's gonna like yield a result on each call it will give you like one of its little answers but we want to go ahead and roll that out to a full list right because we want to just re we're not returning an iterable we're returning a list and then we're gonna return that I don't know if that's gonna work so I'm just gonna have to run it and find out name reduce is not defined that makes sense so for some reason um map is a built-in global function but reduce isn't so you have to say from func tools import reduce like that argument two must support iteration on reduce so here's reduce of course this lambda is one expression so that comma um, what it should do is once it finds this key lambda keyword it should evaluate that entire expression and then return like uh, some sort of function definition right there right instead of that and then this one what did it say specifically so Python the errors start from the bottom up like that instead of the other way so reduce argument two must support iteration, which is that n on line four. And we are on line four. And that n should be numbers, right? So map is going to pass in um, what am I doing wrong here? Oh, I can't think. It's crazy. Sorry about that. So map. Okay, if I just pass it numbers over here, that should be fine. Okay, that's what I'm doing wrong. I need to just pass through numbers. It All these things are, this variable numbers is still in scope to them. And what map is, is it's a different number. It's that individual number. So it's going through each number and numbers over here. Whereas reduce is more of a one-off, even though we're actually calling it a lot more times than we want to admit. Um, so numbers, is this is for a single number there. And what I forgot to do was I want to divide that result, because this is going to multiply every single number together, and then we need to divide it by each number to get you know numbers without one in it, you know which will be the same thing 120 it's the same thing as all of them multiplied to get like two three four five multiplied together right if you multiply by one it doesn't change anything so the first time through that doesn't do anything the next time through it should be 120 or no is it 60 times 2 120 and then it divides it by two yeah that's right it's always going to be 120 and then it's going to divide it by two and get to 60 so anyway so there it is uh, and these are both runs this top one I'll go ahead and 
label these, make them a little easier to read here. Iterative. Do like a colon. Oops. Oh. Okay, and then same thing up here. But instead of iterative, it will say functional. And then functional, I happen to think I know that it is one more character, so I'll do this to line it up. Five. All right, there we go. And the functional answer, we're getting the same answer as the iterative, so that's looking good. Okay, and then for a quick discussion on this is that reduce is obviously running every time through. Um, I would like to think in a purely functional language, ideally reduce the answer of reduce since there's not, you're not supposed to be able to be just willy nilly changing state and stuff like that. So most everything is um, is like a constant, right? So if if you take this, this function call right here with these same par you know this function with these parameters then that result can be cached or hashed or both it's a uh, memoized memoization and that which is like a computer version of memorization right it's memoization like if you take a memo note that's what it does so that would make it to where in a purely functional language, just like how they have tail call optimizations and stuff like that, that wouldn't be inefficient because the first time it would run through and it would actually evaluate it and then all the rest of the calls, it would just really quick do a hash lookup and that would be like constant time lookup very quick. Okay, but in Python, Python is not a purely functional language. These were tack-ons added so it's just there to be there because somebody took the time to add in the map filter and reduce kind of stuff and uh so it like it's there for illustrative purposes basically more or less and um so this isn't efficient so what we would want to do is we'd want to like ideally maybe extract reduce out of here and we could just like since we know it's going to be the product of all of those values multiplied together it's like a one-off thing we can do it one time it doesn't like i was kind of insinuating before it doesn't really need to happen every single time so uh we could do that right here and save that to a variable like did i copy that i'll just get rid of that and say y here and then uh y equals we could do that right and this will run exactly the same should it does and we get all the good answers so but now what's going on is we got a little bit of state here and like it depends on what language you're using whether or not you can get away with like in the functional paradigm you're supposed to avoid assigning variables even if you I, I don't even I'm not a experienced functional programmer by any means so I can't say for sure but I want to say that some languages maybe like Haskell and stuff don't even let you to my uh, assumption they don't even let you just like I was saying willy-nilly assign variables like that so this isn't really that where you can see where it's starting to get sticky to be using this in Python because it's like well are you programming functional well if you are then you shouldn't be using this variable <laughs> you know that's not very clean but for some reason you, so you can only really program like half-baked functional to be efficient but then even then you're still making a function call you know what I mean you're making function calls so it's like uh, and then you have a potential on large uh, lists and stuff to blow out the stack so that's not cool but what we can do is combine these two ideas right here and we can get the best of both worlds so if I come down to like right here I guess and say uh, iterative two. So this is, it's gonna be more iterative, but it's gonna borrow a lot from the functional stuff. A lot of that succinctness. Iterative two numbers. 
but overall it's definitely going to be an iterative solution very pythonic very idiomatic okay so what we can do here is a, another a list comprehension like i was talking about before and this one's going to be for n in numbers so for each one of those numbers we want to come over here which is kind of like what the map thing was doing right that's saying for each one of these numbers pass it to this little function expression right here which just does that so if we replace that function expression right here which was like a, I'll write it in all caps function expression like that with a n pass to it right so that's kind of like what's going on there and then we could do the lambda but we don't that's not really how it goes so what we do is we grab this reduce that's what effectively goes right here I say effectively a lot in case you didn't know and it is like sometimes but uh so the lambda works for the reduce in this case we could of course define a function out here and then just put the name there and pass pass it the name which equals a definition so on and so forth but this should work I believe and then we need to do that division divide it by n so you can kind of see how that's playing out how we had it before if we make this a little bit less efficient again or actually kind of a lot less efficient and replace this y right there and then I'm gonna this won't run the iterative 2 I haven't told it to yet I'm just making sure I did that other one right okay so that one's good still and then this one will be will return this and then hit come down here tell it to run iterative 2 instead okay looking good so that called iterative 2 and in one line even shorter and succincter with no well there could be a stack over overflow here because of this reduce call um so these i i don't personally know a good way to handle reduce any more idiomatically in python so uh that's about the most succinct way i think to do it of course it's borrowing for this import up here it's just reusing it down there for the import so but of course it's calling it every time just like it was in that functional situation so what we can do is get rid of that and just say something like this and then that's kind of like how i was saying you know so now you're you're extracting it out and assigning it to a value right there but that's fine because this is python you're allowed to do that and then there so this is probably the best way to do it oh one of the best ways i have personally don't know a better way to do it so there it is seems to be working fine so that's it bam that solves that whole problem that's the most pythonic way to do it i don't know i can't think of a better way to do reduce i'll just shut up about it but i like these comprehensions are for lists and it's like if you try and like force that once you get into the idea of like you're forcing a certain type of pattern on something instead of just like letting it gracefully apply then i just don't feel like it's that good so like i said best of both worlds it's borrowing reduced from the sort of functional paradigm and then it's um you know being totally idiomatic there and we're not using any more extraneous variables than we need to so that's one of the things when you do if you do see this like you're doing some loopings down here and you're starting off by with an empty loop or excuse me an empty list like initializing an empty list and then returning it and doing that kind of a general pattern then that's telling you that there's probably a way to work in a list comprehension and really flatten that down and this reads well if you know how to read it you start here you skip that first part that's that's what gets returned um, each iteration through but you say four and in numbers which is oh man I, my brain's not working right now so i'm not going to try and explain it because i won't be smooth with it but you get the idea feel free to read it and practice doing that if you want okay and then what i'm going to do is now i'm going to do the truly recursive version because at first i started out when i was practicing this earlier and i was calling this one recursive solution but then i was like you know what i'm not calling my function recursively i mean i realize 
map and stuff is like sort of and reduce or like recursive functions and functional within themselves but they're not to me the recursive solution has to call itself like blatantly to you know i don't know just so that's why i'm going to do a recursive solution as well and it gets a little bit less help from the map you know i'm not going to utilize map and, or reduce so recursive going to take numbers and then uh I'll do that. And we'll change this to recursive. Like that. And I'll need to put a space there to line that up too. Okay. Now with the recursive, I kind of tried this a few different ways at first, and I was going to try and do like a monolith recursive function where, because with recursiveness, you can like, you can have like an initialization function that isn't like a wrapper function that's not necessarily recursive itself to kind of like set up data structures and stuff. And it's like, I'll do that with like real world problems sometimes, but I don't feel like that's pure recursive. So that's where it's back leaning towards the monolithic version of trying to be like keep everything in there and then if it gets too crazy complex where it's hard to wrap your head around or just doesn't even seem you know like within reason keep it as monolithic as possible so that's what I'm going to go for here so what we want to do is we want to keep the you know the effective signature there I go again with effective to where you just pass it a list from the outside world you know, API wise or whatever that public API wise, you're going to pass it the, uh, you're going to call it and pass it one single list. But once we get in within ourselves here, we're going to, hmm, we're going to have results, which we're going to initialize to none, which is like uh, roughly equivalent of null in Python. In JavaScript, you could just have that as like a parameter and just leave it undefined but any of the other language most of the other general purpose languages you're gonna probably just pass a null in so you will have to pass a null in if you do it like more leaning towards this exact type of a signature and then we'll use the depth and the depth is an optional thing you can use with recursion to sort of track what depth you're at and it's kind of like an index value effectively so we're going to start that at negative one for what you know we could start it you know we basically we want to be at zero of course when we start but for reasons you'll see soon we'll have to start that at negative one so these are keyword parameters with default values so in python you can still just call it with just you can just call it like that like we have down here and if it doesn't get a positional value or a keyword value for these, then it will just assign them those initial values by default. That's what's going on there. And what we're going to test right out the gate is if not results. So what we're basically saying is if results is not defined, we've defined it to none and that will evaluate to false for if results. And so we're saying if not results, so we're flipping that to true which will make this run if results isn't defined. And uh, then we want to say results equals, I can't believe how shot my brain is, it's crazy. Um, and we'll do that thing we were talking about earlier, where we'll initialize the whole thing to the length of numbers. And I thought, oh, it'd be cool if you could just do that up here, like, do like none, you know, that exact thing, like the length of numbers, but that doesn't work in Python because it will give you a numbers not defined thing. But who knows, maybe in a future version, put it in a feature request or something and they'll be able to evaluate it like that since in theory, it should have access to it, I would think. So that's what we got to do and that's all right for now too because in like javascript you'd want to do like the similar thing to say like 
you know, if not results, like if the results is undefined, basically, um, then you'd want to go through and create a, a, well, in JavaScript, you don't have to create an empty list. You can, an array list or an array like in JavaScript, you can just willy nilly assign index values and you could assign something at nine and not have anything at zero or whatever. So you don't really have to have to do much there. But what you would have to do is actually create that, uh, that array like at some point, like right there. Because I only use, I pretty much 99% of the time stick to ES5 minus, preferring ES3. So I don't know if JavaScript, like one of the newer ECMAScript things might have keyword variables or whatever. I don't even care, honestly. But if it does and you like to use that version of ES2020 or whatever it is, then feel free, of course. Um, so what that will do is basically the first time this is called, that will default to none and it will initialize a results list, which will be used thereafter until the very final results is returned. And that's this will be the final results. Okay, so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of like borrow this, pass in the bucket kind of thing and say, hey, um, if your depth is greater than two, brain going out, running out of batteries, if your depth is greater than two, then no. Okay, uh, give me a minute on that one. Might be one, I can't remember. Um, it needs a sip of green tea. I've been drinking green tea half the day instead of coffee and it's not fitting the bill. Need more caffeine. Maybe I should chug. Okay. So basically, okay, if I'm totally off there, if depth is, it's amazing what a sip can do. If depth is less than the length of numbers minus one, so if numbers is 10, length zero through nine, and we get minus one, that will be index value nine will line up so we'll be zero through nine there then uh, we're gonna call the recursive call which whatever you happen to name this function ideally something more readable within the context and what it's doing and whatnot uh, we're gonna call it we're gonna pass it the same old numbers we're gonna pass it results which should now be initialized and then we're gonna pass it the depth but since in Python we can't do like a depth plus plus right here like we can't really, I don't think we can to any way that I know. So we're going to do depth equals depth plus one, but we're in Python, so we can just do depth plus equals one like that. And a lot of other languages too, right? Okay. And that's why we don't have depth at zero because we're going to come in and we're going to want to do this every time. You know, the recursive function has to kind of work for the first case and all the way through to the last case. If we had this at zero and we came in here and if we incremented it right there, then we'd be at one and we'd be skipping the zero deal. So it'd be like, uh-oh, we didn't handle zero. But then, um, well, we would handle zero, but the problem is, is how do we increment it? You know what I mean? So then you got to come back up here and go, well, we need to increment it by the time we get here. And, uh, so it boils down to you basically have to increment it there. So that's why it's at negative one, so that it will effectively get incremented to zero. And then it will pass zero into here um, every other time through this call, besides the very, very, very first time right here, it will skip that and it will increment this immediately. So this will be the very first thing that happens um, after, you know, after that very one time, one off initialization right there. So that's a lot like depth plus plus, effectively. And so it's going to run that no matter what. This isn't going to be an else. It's going to say, you know, uh, basically call off that recursive, call off another one of yourself, but we're going to increment depth by one so that 
for each depth, if you see where that's going, that depth is like akin to the index value. So it's going to keep doing that. So each one's going to do like a little buddy system and call, go ahead and spin off one more instance of this function being called. And that's it. And that's as long as the depth's less than length of the numbers minus one. Okay. And then what we're going to do is another sip. Two sips. Okay. Then we need to do the results of where we're at. So we're uh, results at depth gets to equal oh I can't think this sucks I'm not gonna look at my old source it's cheating <sighs> gotta breathe too remember to breathe okay if depth is less than that then go ahead and call off another instance we don't need to save that result because what it's doing is it's passing like right here on this line we don't need to assign that to any kind of a variable specifically because result is a mutable list which means that it can be changed in place and it's stored on the heap passed around by reference so um, of course it's just a variable set to effectively nothing there then we come in and right here we set that list so this is where it really you know as far as I know this would just be like stack maybe and then this would be heap and then this is going to be reference address to that heap value so then we're going to pass this um, we're going to just pass that reference through so anytime it changes it, it's sort of like C programming style you know it's side effecty and that just happens to work, I think, the simplest way right here. But we're encapsulating that side effect within here, you know, because we're, you know, it would be really bad, I think, if we created the result list out here and passed it in. Um, that would be really C programming style, but we're just doing it in here. We're, and we're uh, sandboxing the side effects, I feel like. Okay, so then results depth, that one's going to get. And here's where we kind of do that thing where we splice the list and get rid of the index values. So we'll say numbers. And whenever you do this type of notation with anything on any, either side of those or nothing at all, whenever you have the brackets and the semicolon like that in Python with a mutable list, then you know you're getting a copy of that list. But it shouldn't really matter in this case. But if you're trying not to mutate a list, but you need to pass it around and you want to like whittle away at that list, then that would be the way to do it. So numbers and we're going to go up to but not including the depth and then we're gonna append on to that the rest of numbers just after depth so depth plus one and that will effectively give us the rest there and then we are going to return results okay so one time back through, we come in, we take that list. These are set to default values uh, right there. We check on the very first time, or we check every time, but only on the very first time it will come in and initialize this none times length of numbers. Then we uh, increment the depth, effectively setting it at zero the first time through. We come through, if zero is less than we are just use 10 to keep it simple. 10 minus 1 would be 9. Um, then go ahead and call in here and send in that 9 up to and through 9. Um, of course, if it was 10, we wouldn't want to say 10 because then we get an index out of range. And we're not saving, they, since this thing is going to call itself, all of those are eventually going to evaluate to this and they're going to be at different depths, 0 through 9 effectively. And then each one's going to get that respective value here. And then they are going to. Oh. Shit, what am I not multiplying here? Wow, I can't believe my brain shorted out on me. 
Um, here's where we need to do depth equals here's depth. Wow, come on, brain, work. Okay. <laughs> wow, took me a second. Got just enough to make it through. We need a multiply function. And we're going to say multiply. This is going to be another recursive function. I had originally tried to embed this functionality within this one, and I was just like, no, that's too complex, not worth it, split it out, you know, don't get crazy. Uh, you can, that's a challenge for yourself, of course, if you want to do that. Uh, multiply, it's going to take in this sublist of numbers minus that depth index, and then it's going to return um, numbers zero, times multiply and then this is going to get the rest of numbers numbers from uh, one and on so when it comes in here it's going to call multiply with this sub list which the first time through this will be zero right and this will be one through nine and then this will take that new index zero which will have been one you know, out here originally the first time through, and then it will pull that off effectively, pull off that first value on that one shorter list, and it will call itself again, and it will skip that very first value. So it will go from index one on instead of zero on, and it will call itself again, and then that will effectively be index two, third number, and shorter list, and so on and so forth. And what we need to do is make sure that if uh, the length of multiply is greater than one, then do that. Otherwise, we're going to return num numbers zero like that so it will go through and as long as this multiply list has two or more values in it then it will go in here and split off that first value and call the list with the second and further values and just keep on doing that until finally it comes in and it's like oh I've only got one value left in my list. And we'll say, okay, we'll just return that one value, which we know will have to be at the first index of zero. And then when it comes back out, it will start unwinding or rewinding, whichever way you want to think of it as. And it will say like, okay, so in this one, it will get all the way to that five and it will come back. And then this will have been that four and it will say five times four. And then it will unwind again and it will, uh, that will be 20. So then the result coming back out of that next unwind will be 20 times three and so on all the way back out and that's the way that works and then that will of course it's skipping the depth for that current iteration and it will store that at that index of results and then it will return results so i don't blame you if you lost what was going on right there if you're not used to doing recursive programming um you can see even my brain shorted out and i've already gone through it a couple times today so it's like I don't really have any excuse, I don't think, besides maybe lack of caffeine, but that's not a good excuse. Okay, so let's run it and see if it works. Of course not. Uh, object type function has no length on line two. So this is line two, length of multiply, wow. Numbers. Okay, let's see. Boom, there it is. So they're all looking pretty good. So those are the three major ways to do it with a couple of explanations and trade-offs. I still think this is, of course, the shortest, sweetest, bestest version out of all of them. Um, and my second favorite would probably be that one. 
and I'm not personally a big fan of map and reduce, so I probably just like this regular old like manual recursion one. Um, but I'll give it a tie with map and reduce because map and reduce is so succinct right there. But yeah, there, there you go. There's the three different ways, and of course each one of the you know it's kind of like this is its own little world right here that takes those inputs. That, you know these would be in place of each other. You probably wouldn't normally include all these options in one file you know you probably just pick one of these solutions or one or the other of those thanks a lot for watching